call this Dojo Game Review. And then we're done with the trial, done with the resolu resolution trial. It's not that much money to join the training program though, my friends, easy. All right, so this is uh, something I've been wanting to do more of where I just go into the database and look at some of these games that uh, people have been posting. For the most part, they're great. DM Hokey updates the database about every month. And so he updated on the third. So uh, I wanna do that. And I also, so these are just games that I just selected kind of at random. The only criteria really that were recently submitted. So these games that we're gonna see today and the notes were submitted fairly recently. Uh, and then in the graduate show, I also go over games uh, that people, from people who graduated. And usually that's on Monday, so that'll probably be tomorrow. Okay, so first thing actually I'm gonna do while people are, are filing in, there's a new um, sensei question. So there's a couple ways, it's a little bit hard to say that this is the most efficient way we've got it, but people ask questions on the Discord. And uh, one way to do it is a sensei question. So that way, either me, Kosi, or David will answer it. Sometimes DM Hokey if it's a technical question. Um, <clears throat> and then we have another one called tech feedback. Though a lot of times the questions there are questions that aren't tech related. They're actually program related. So it's good to keep those separated. You could, of course, ask a question in the general channel, but then those tend to get lost. And then you can also go ask a question in the things called questions where there's threads. And that's, if you really have a question, I think that's an earnest question, let's say. That's the way to do it. All right, so let's read this uh, business here. Cry, can you get this together, buddy? Um, all right, Pepper Chest just signed up, nice. Okay, let me read this question. So this is gonna be a sensei question. Oh, this is a depressing one. <laughs> Sometimes we get depressing questions. Here we go. I worry I am losing my passion for chess. I started less than half a year ago and was completely enthralled. Thrall, by the way, is, uh, I think it's an ancient Scandinavian word for slave, so it really means enslaved. Now I just play an occasional game and I really, really miss the thrill of training. How can I rekindle that flame? Well, that's an interesting question. I might mold it over a second before I answer it. But, you know, when you play, do anything for a long time, you're going to have ups and downs, right? And I think one thing that's interesting about this current generation of, let's call it, Queen's Gambit people is some of them got so hot. <laughs> that's great. It's been great for chess that they got so hot. Um, but then, you know, it's going to be difficult and there's gonna be moments of depression, of when you hit some kind of plateau and you're not getting any kind of positive feedback. You know, you start any hobby, and if you go for it in the first couple months, you're gonna make amazing progress. At some point, you're gonna hit a plateau where the gains are gonna come much slower, and you might even regress a little bit. And at that point, you're gonna lose, you're gonna, it's gonna feel like you're losing passion for the game, but what's actually happening is you're not getting any positive feedback, right, from what's going on. It's just a very human thing, right? So um, I do think, though, that I'd like to think that in the dojo training program that we have a community of people that will help you get past that. And for me, the thing that's always kept me coming back to chess for decades has been the beauty of the game. Uh, of course, I enjoy the struggle too. I enjoy the community. And I've definitely had moments though. <laughs> I've definitely had moments most recently when uh, I felt like oh, my game was in really reasonable form this summer and I won the first five games of the US Senior Open. And I just needed to draw that last to, to get into the US Senior Closed and I blew it very painful and then I played a tournament after that and I blew it in there and then I got so depressed you know I wasn't going over my games in the proper way and just recently you know I actually told your mom I was like dude you need to coach me once a week just so I'm forced to keep the habit going of going over my games 
Okay, we got a question from Pepper. In notations, how do you enter and notate on alternate moves, like move three here? Let's see what he's talking about. Let's get in first, just read what uh, Johansson is saying. Okay, let's flip the board because he's black. Okay, now one of the things I will say for Johansson's level is I think it would be helpful for him if he didn't even know the name uh, English because if you just instead forget about all the names and think about good moves and bad moves in terms of opening principles, you will play better moves and you will be less confused. Like you're doing fine here. Fine. Okay. <laughs> Let's see what he writes. <coughs> Bishop B4 seems to me the most common move here. Now, this is an example. Um, there's nothing really wrong with Bishop C5, right? So... Is it helpful for you at this level, at the level of 1159, which FIDE is probably a little lower than that, is it helpful for you to go look in the database and think about uh, bishop b4 being better, right? Uh, my sense is no. <laughs> my sense is no. Bishop c5 is fine. Now let me just do this with pepper chest. How do you enter and notate on alternate moves like move three here? Well, you kind of do what he did. So he mentioned bishop b4, bishop d2, and castles. And if I was going to say anything, it would be helpful for him and for me if he said, I like this better for black, for example, right? Um, and if you like bishop b4, better it would be good to say why you like it better than bishop c5 or why you think that might be a better move because just seeing it in the database is saying it scores better that doesn't help anybody right that doesn't help anybody at all um <laughs> if i was going to say there is a problem with bishop c5 i'm not sure there is but if you wanted to critique it you would say, well, maybe e3 is a reasonable move here for black and then or excuse me for white and then the bishop might feel funny on, um, on c5. Okay, here we go. g3 is not going to test uh, bishop c5. Okay, now here's an interesting moment here with c6. Uh, I'm about to read this long chat from Mortal Wombat. <laughs> it's a long one, but I want to read this one first. Preparing to fight for the center next move with d5. And D6, of course, would have been fine. And one of the things that's interesting about C6, I've talked a lot about this in similar positions, is you arguably with C6, you're not just playing for D5, but you're also playing to blunt the bishop on G2 and blunt the knight on C3. So next move, we don't, we're not committed to play D5. We can play D6 next too. Okay. And we'll also say from the perspective of opening principles, it would be easier for black to play moves like d6 and knight c6. All right, let's read Mortal Wombat. Hi, I just came across the dojo. This looks like a great place to learn. Awkward question. I'm having a few problems dealing with anxiety. For a second, I thought he said sobriety. <laughs> anxiety, playing real people. Sometimes I go weeks without even a single blitz game. Wondering if the dojo might be a good place for me. Worried I might freeze up when asked to play with the other participants. Interesting. Now, if you had anxiety about dealing with people IRL, I would, I would get it, but I guess you're saying you have anxiety about people even uh, online. Um, all I can say is people in the dojo are pretty cool. They're more cool than I am. I'm a mean bastard sometimes. I say terrible things. You know? <laughs> but in general, the dojo community is pretty great. Yeah. Let's ask another question here. Tom is asking, when you go over your games, is it more about practicing your analysis skills in a calm environment, or is it about identifying mistakes and lessons to take forward? Both. Both. You're definitely doing both. And, um, for example, one great thing, let's say, about this decision between bishop c5 and bishop b4, is if you have strong feelings on it, then this is your time to write about it. Like to me, uh, maybe I like bishop b4 a little bit better, but that would be fine, that's a deep argument. But uh, I would want to then say why I like it better. For example, 
if I was going to make a discourse about it, and indeed, when I do my notes, I write about a lot of this stuff, I would say Bishop B4, I like better because I'm, by putting pressure on the knight, really what I'm doing is I'm going to get rid of this bishop. He's going to go. And I'd love if he gave me a tempo with a3 in order to get rid of it. Uh, he, I'm going to get rid of the thing, and then I'm going to play d6 and, you know, castles. Now, I don't have to, I'm no rush to get rid of the thing, right? But the idea would be then for me to say, oh, well, I'm going to put my pawns in dark squares, and therefore my good bishop will meet by bishop on c8, right? So that would be an example of a way to talk about what's going on. And like I said, I think the drawback of bishop c5, if you're going to make a case, it's a fine move, by the way, would be e3. But once white plays g3, then we're fine because, why? Because it doesn't make sense for white to play both of these moves, right? So then you get into it and you say, oh, if that's the case, then I can play knight c6 because that's we know that's a good move. And then if g3, bishop c5. Now, here's an example of what I'm talking about. Instead of looking at the database and stuff and just thinking about opening principles, you know, you can say, this just looks good. And then if you got to the level of 1900, 1800, then you say, oh, right, Kasp uh, Karpov played this eight m ages ago and millions of times, right? With an interesting system, often playing a6 and uh, even h6, weird, right? <laughs> but that's known as the Karpov system against the English. Um, whereas bishop c5, right, like I said, e3 is more of an issue. Okay, so, um, okay, so, um, here we go. Pop, c6, e3. Now, So I don't think it's unreasonable because he's blunting your bishop. He also has the dream of playing knight e2. Now, he is uh, taking a tempo out to do this. Okay. Now, one of the interesting things that I want you to see about this position is that when he plays d4, we would really rather not be forced to take on d4. Because if we take on d4, then we solve his now poor piece. That is the, the problem of e3, okay, in addition to losing time. Also, what he's saying to you is that the knight on e2 will be better, in his mind, than the knight on f3 because it's not blocking the bishop. But that's not entirely clear to me, right? Because uh, the knight on e2 is nobody's champion. Another reason, then, not to take on d4 when he does play d4 because the pawn on e5 will dominate this knight on e2. So what does that point us to? It points us to the fact that d5 maybe, maybe is something we don't want uh, because we are going to have to answer to the d4 move. Okay, So d6 would be the calm way of playing the position with the intention that if he ever does play d4, I'm just going to back it up. I'm just going to back it up. Say, what do you want? Now I'll play knight d7 next, rook e8, the whole business. You could begin with rook e8 here if you wanted to. All right, so here, d5, he's following through with his intention. And here we have an interesting uh, annotation. Pop, I'd rather not you didn't take it. And here, of course, he would play knight e2 because that's his intention. And um, what is nice about your position here is that because there's friction on c4, uh, it's not totally easy uh, for him to develop naturally. Now, I don't agree that black is clearly better, but what I love about what you're saying is you are giving an evaluation and then saying why you like it. Great. And this is a reason to do it without the computer. You can check with the computer after you've done it, by the way, but really to try to put in your own words what you think is going on here. Okay, so let's go. Now, why is CD controversial from his point of view? Because a problem with your C6 move is you blocked your knight. Now, no longer a problem. Thank you very much. 
Now EG2. Okay, so now we have our big question. To me, to my mind, anyway, big question. Could you have played d4? Interesting question. What's the reason to play d4? To pop his knight on, uh, on c3. Controversial, because maybe you are going to be freeing his bishop on c1. In any case, if I was black here, that would be some variations I would be looking at. And I would definitely be looking at my most natural move here as knight c6. But again, we're going to have to deal with his d4 move at some point. e4. Mm, mm, I'm not sure I like it. I'm not sure I like it. Now, one thing uh, I've noticed, I knew about this about myself as a kid, too, is I was prone to wanting to, like, violently do something where it's not clear the white flag needs to do something. Black has a small advantage because he's got more time and more space. So the default move should definitely be knight c6. However, you do want to address, I was going to say the monkey in the room, but there's no monkey in the room. <laughs> the monkey in the room. You do want to address, what are you going to do after white plays d4? And we'd rather not take, because we'd rather not free the bishop on c1. So is there some way we could prevent d4? Well, now, of course, because you played bishop f5 instead of knight c6, if we do play d4, we got to wonder about bishop takes b7. Maybe not so pleasant for a peasant. Um, and the reason I don't like e4 is now you're going to be giving him a French structure uh, where the knight on e2 suddenly gets a roll. Okay, so again, this pawn is doing a great job controlling this knight. Now, to be fair, I don't, I'm not sure I have a great move for you here. Um, let me just go back one move. Let's say we had played knight c6. I think the guy should play d4, by the way, and be maybe only a touch worse. He might be just fine, in fact, with d4. <clears throat> so then the question becomes, well, could I have done that? Maybe. And here's, here's where it got interesting for me. Pop, 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 pop. And I would love to do this move, but A, there's that problem, and B, he just plays knight f4. So... This is, seems fine for the dude. So bummer. So this would be a situation, if I was analyzing the game, I'd want to spend some time and think about uh, how to play the position. By the way, I want to say, Johansson, you are playing much above the level of 1159. You're doing great. So pawn moves are not developing moves. Now he plays d4 one Interesting question would be, could he have played knight f4? Just to try to fix his piece. And then the tactical soiree, if I may, <laughs> the tactical soiree would be, yeah, on knight c6, does he have anything spicy? And he might, because d4, and then I don't know how you, you, you might have grief holding on to your d5 pawn. Okay, so he plays d4, and then what have we got? We now have a French structure, and you as black are playing the white side of a French, right? And you're right. Let's read what you write about bishop b6. This was the wrong place to move my bishop. I wanted to bring it closer to the king's side where I had more of a spatial advantage, but I didn't realize that it blocked my queen's defense of the d5 pawn. Good. So let's talk about the French structure for a second. Your first aim with the French is going to be, before you're allowed to attack, is going to be to consolidate the d5 pawn, right? Because the French player has a very simple plan. They just want to wail on that thing. Do a little Waylon Jennings on that pawn on d5. Um, and if really, if they can harass you long enough, then they're not going to get mated. Right? That's their idea anyway. OK. 
Okay, so right. This is why e4 is not the greatest in addition to knight f4. And of course you want to go to d6. That's your most natural move. And here you do this, this thing, which is, a, oh, I guess we're going to call that a tactical, I'm not guessing, it is a tactical mistake. Um, and one thing that would have been interesting here would be bishop e6, giving him the pawn in return for development. And our strategic aim here would be to say, look, if I can just consolidate the d5 point, I can start trying to mate him, right? That would be in line with your bishop to d6 move. All right, we'll see if White found it. No, he did not, weird move. Knight takes d5, excellent. Now people, a lot of times people talking to me uh, cry, I, I, I need to learn tactics, how do I do it? This is how you do it, right? Both players miss knight d5, and then uh, Johansson found it in the postmortem. They're not gonna miss it again. We got a question from Oberlis. Yeah, I submitted some games. How can it be Twitch analyzed? So, uh, by the way, I'm a little slow sometimes on the chat because I'm just looking at this thing. Um, uh, I try to do at least one stream like this a week. It doesn't always happen <laughs> because of life. But I try to do this once a week where I pick recently submitted games. And then definitely once a week I do the graduate stream. And if you are a graduate and have some games in the database and a look at some of your annotations. Right now, that's my process. So who gets a piece, uh, who gets analyzed at the moment is a little bit um, just by chance, which I think is a good thing. I'm just trying to feature games. It's also my way of checking in on the database, right? Okay. Here we go. Queen b5, weird. Knight d7. To me, uh, knight c6 seems more logical. It controls more squares. On, on d7, it controls uh, six squares. On c6, it controls eight. I guess you were motivated. Actually, this is interesting. I think it wasn't clear for a second. You were motivated by the idea that you could take back with the knight. Not unreasonable, not unreasonable. Um, but taking back with the pawn needs to be said, that also activates your rook, right? Weird. What, what, let's stress something. So I've said it a thousand times. Once you get past 1,000, up to 1,000, it's about people dropping pieces, right? And even past that, you'll see people still dropping pieces, but really, where the games are decided under 1,000, somebody's hanging something. At this level, what we're common seeing is people losing time. And here, A3, obviously, just a loss of time. Okay, here, we could have considered Rook FCA2. Little weird. Why? Because of loss of time. So, um, Interesting moment. Given that you played knight d7 already, I think uh, a6 would make some sense here. a6 looks like a good position for you. You're, it's a cheap trick. <laughs> it's a cheap trick. Uh, he's threatening queen b5. And even then, it's a little bit complicated. Now, yeah, okay. Bishop g4. It's growing on me a little bit, honestly. And then he takes. Notice that when he takes, he is going to be mobilizing your knight. So again, uh, a problem with time. Um, it's a fascinating position. And this is a good one to practice tactics. So you note, it, note that this is going down. But if we go one move deeper, we see that knight takes d6, and life is significantly complicated because our rook is hanging as well. So in fact, I think queen b6, we're gonna say he's releasing the tension, he's helping your knight develop, and then it's got powerful squares. 
So either rook fc1 or rook ac1. And he needs to do one of those moves so that we don't get a rook landing on c2. If those moves didn't work, then he should consider f3. Because this is very much helping you. Now he does do f3. Okay, in this position, we definitely, we're going to say we believe in this position for you. We believe in your position here. Okay, now, you play bishop f3, and you're definitely going to have a nice position there. The issue with it will be... Um, that the rook on f3 might serve a purpose controlling e3. So why do I bring that up? I bring it up because this move might be much better. It might be winning. Yeah, it might be winning later, too. <laughs> it might be winning later, too. Um, the point is that um, I don't want, I'm, not, I'm in no rush to take on f3. Think anyway. Okay, so snip, snop, knight e4, and I don't like that move. That might still be a fine move, honestly. We're about to, we're gonna look at it some. It's his position really is terrible at this point. It's it's gotta be said. Bishop e1. Okay, good. Good move. And now you didn't know what to do, and you released the tension with knight c3. Okay. Um, so one of the things for the annotation here is you want to, if you don't like knight c3, you really want to try to identify what move you do like. Right? Um... <clears throat> it's a very interesting position. And we might have already given up the bulk of our advantage already. Maybe. <laughs> I still believe in your position. In fact, I'm going to say this looks like a nice move. Now, you would have to analyze knight d5, knight b2. The, the joy of this position, though, is that our knights on the light squares really are doing a great dance. And then the tactical point is that on rook b1, we have time to do this. And is it very complicated? Yes. We also have time to play rook c2. So we have two nice choices, and we really are uh, invading well. Okay. Again, Johansson, all this stuff I'm saying, for 11.59, boss, you're playing this... Amazing. Amazing. Um, <clears throat> I like what you said here, especially that you were uncertain about who is better. Right. And the point we should say is that he it's hard for black to, to do things. And the knight on c3 really ties down your knight on b6. And so, white at least has dreams of being better. Good. And bishop c3, you're absolutely right. What a weird move. Can't be wrong. Now you say that rook e7 is better than c7, but you should say why. Because at first blush, they look like the same. If anything, I guess, okay, so bishop a5, you're saying bishop a5 should be played. Okay, I think I like it. Um, there'll be, there's some interesting questions, though, about that bishop a5 move. We'll have to look into it. Um, hmm. Okay, so I think you kind of answer your question later why you like rookie seven. Just gives you a little bit more flexibility with the rook, because right. With the rook e7, if he plays something like moving the bishop, then our rook will be able to talk without having to worry about this pawn. Now, one thing we should say from this position with rook a f1 is it looks like a violent move, 
But a lot of times these positions, like the rooks aren't doing anything, you know, over there. They just look fancy. So even a move like f6, we got to say that's not that dumb, right? I free the rooks. My king gets some luft. No problemo. Okay, king g2. No one understands. Oh, I don't like that one. Oh, maybe I don't dislike it, actually. <laughs> maybe it's fine. Okay, no. King g2, totally weird. You're right. Bishop a5 should have been played. And now he's got a concrete problem with knight c4 coming. Very good. Hey, I think he might be toast. Snip. Very good. Yeah. Now we're playing chess. And now he's lost. Now, um... At first blush, and to me, knight e3 seems much stronger than rook e3. Uh, because we'll have, because the, the knight is an octopus there, and we have things like knight f5 and knight g4 in the air. So I'd rather not trade off his silly rook on f3. His rook is silly on f3. But your position's amazing here. That move makes me nervous, rook e3, because you're allowing b3. I get it. b3 isn't immediately possible. Uh, my opponent decided to resign here, which makes zero sense. <laughs> okay, good. Good. Yeah, I think it is technically lost. But right, there's everything still to play for. Mm -hmm. Maybe even trying to trade this bad boy off here. Mm -hmm. Okay, Johansson, great game, man. Great game. Um, Polsky, as, uh, yeah, I always do a notice. So if you see on stream, I sent a, an at everyone to the, to everyone, but then also I mentioned whose games I would be going over. DM Stewart asks, are your game choices always from online or do you pull some over the board? Oh my God, Finbar. Thank you for gifting. Are your game choices always from online or do you pull some OTB games from recent submissions? Basically, it's always recent submissions. Not all of them are OTB. Uh, a lot of them, I'm not even sure. This one, I guess, was a 60-minute game. But basically, there were recent games. These games today I just pulled from our database for games that um, were recently submitted. Thanks again, Finvar. Thank you. Scott F., do these analysis streams end up on YouTube? Oh, yeah. Well, we have a second one called Chess Dojo Live, a second YouTube where we put the long form content. And uh, we got to get Braden on that, man. <laughs> so hopefully they do. They're definitely always on the video on demand, right? Which means that for the next couple months or so, they'll be on our Twitch stream available. But I do want Braden to put those on our, these also on our Chess Dojo Live. Thank you for that, Scott F. Help me, help me burden Braden. <laughs> <laughs> with putting this thing on uh, our normal YouTube, our, our secondary YouTube. We have to have a second one because the algorithm doesn't like it for our main one if we put long videos on there. So that's why we've got a second one. All right, this next game is from, I'm going to call him Imagion. That might not be how he pronounces it, but he's a long time user of the dojo. And now we're going to get this weird move G4. Okay, pop, pop. And um, this is the Grom's opening. Um, and back in the day, people, the, the, the idea was that Bishop G4 was a mistake, which is this line here. I have no idea what the computer would now say, but at the very minimum, you give black, or excuse me, white, um, some some things for grief, you know? So in addition to queen b3, which is given here as black, I'm not sure I'd feel comfortable with cd. What's the long and the short? There's no reason to take that thing. There's no reason to take that pawn. You know, if you play a move like c6, God, the guy's gonna have to play h3 at some point very soon. Stupid move g4, right? Okay, so e5 can't be wrong. Okay, could you take it now? Probably. 
You could also, though, play a move like c6. I'd rather him just give me the tempo. I'd rather him give me the tempo than to, than to take that pawn. Okay, I think this is probably good, though, Pop. It's going to get hot. It's going to get hot now. Yeah, here it comes. I love that you're writing quick critical moment. Absolutely correct. Now, why do I stress that? One of the things I've learned from analyzing my own games is that a key skill uh, is to identify during the game what the critical moments are. And if you haven't reviewed your games, you won't have a sense. You won't have a sense of be like, okay, boss, time to stop. Right? This is not an intuitive decision here. This is one I got to calculate and really think, such as this one. And um, bishop c8, question mark. Yeah, clearly then we're admitting that white is better. And then you know I was going to scream at you because we lost time. DM Stewart says, I know that I'm not confident enough in my analysis skills to propose concrete lines. No, boss. No, oh, but you could do concrete lines. There's nothing wrong with it. And one of the great things in these um, in these submissions we got is we have people from a variety of skill levels, 400, 600, writing down concrete lines. And the key thing that they're doing is they're thinking about what happened in their games and then saying to themselves, all right, well, what should I have done? Right? And then it's, a, it's developing skills for um, how to evaluate positions, what to do, yeah. He does a line with knight bd7, for example, and um, in addition to queen b7, which I think is a little bit maybe more spicy than it needs to be, there's also cd, which I don't know how to evaluate that position. I think that was difficult. Another one I like maybe more than knight d7 is knight c6, with giving him some th something to think about with knight d4. Okay, let's keep going. So cd happens, and now I guess maybe what? White's better? Looks like it. That pawn on d5 is going to be a major pain. I'd rather see knight c3, but okay. Oh, that's terrible. So look, what did white do? He fixed your, your, your knight on d7 is controversial here, right? Now I get it. The, the, now it can't go to c6. It's natural square. So you put it here, but then white fixes your problem, boss. He fixes your problem, boss. Yo! So if I was talking to white, I'd say, boss, just put the knight there. We'll see what black does, okay? We'll figure it all out tomorrow. We're going to first just put the knight there, right? Weird. Like the last game, obsessed with putting the knight on e2. Boss, put your knight on c3. You know it's going to go there. Oh, whoa. Whoa. Totally weird. Totally weird. Now, one of the things... By the way, sometimes it's good to laugh at people. And by that, by people, I mean also yourself. Right? So let's just think about this for a second. White has some idea of what's going on with h4. Personally, I, I'm good at figuring out even weird ideas. I'm a good chess psychologist, but I can't figure out h4. But if you say that, you imagine this guy and just him listening to either me or Proust talk about opening principles, it'd be boss, just put your knight on c3. We're going to go from there. We know the knight has to go to c3, okay? h4, totally unclear. Nobody understands, right? And so what I'm trying to say with that is when people go deep with opening analysis and theory and stuff, especially at a lower level, they're just confusing themselves instead of making their life easier, right? Mortal Wombat, thank you for being here, my friend. Uh, Alessio asks, looking at your dojo works, I begin to analyze my games. I'm this way without the use of engine and the difference is big. You're forced to produce ideas and maybe you will use in future games. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So again, studying the theory often makes things more complicated than they need to be, whereas knight c3 is just the obvious move, right? Um, in my own game, if you were watching my analysis in my own game, I 
tripped myself up in mem memorizing some weird uh, theoretical lines. So you can see whether you're a GM or whatever, uh, the theory is not always something that's a good thing. Totally weird to put it on D2. Strange. Now, what is he thinking? He's thinking, well, uh, I don't want to lose the pawn. And maybe he's thinking he wants to put the bishop on b7. Um, and he wants to gang up on d5. But honestly, it looks to me like well, white's got that covered, especially if he finally puts a knight on c3 with this. So, <laughs> especially after uh, h4, we should declare ourselves as being better in this position, by the way. And there are a couple plans that make a lot of sense to me. One is knight g4, thinking about f5 and brutalization. We might as well put the pawn on knight on g4 now. He's not going anywhere. Another one, excuse me, after knight d2 would be knight d7. And another one, maybe even more simple, is just to play a5, a4. And the intention with a5, a4 just to be to say, hey, I don't actually know where my bishop on c8 wants to go anyway. And a5, a4 will get my rook involved in the game. We have no idea even how he's going to meet a5, a4. We just know that it will be a very unpleasant pawn, especially now because the white king doesn't know where it's going to be in life, you know? So, for example, during the game, those would be the first plans that came to my head. And I think I would settle on a5, a4. Um, and then in the analysis, right, like uh, Alessio says, we practice these plans and we'll see some version of them in the future and we'll get better at analyzing those plans right and what should all of these plans strive for for black they should strive for efficient mobilization of our dudes we're a coach we're throwing our players into the game uh, in a lot of ways white playing h4 just means there's another guy who's sitting on the bench that's all h4 means to me right Okay, here we go. Why do you recommend How to Beat Your Dad at Chess? Okay, um, that book, yes, I think we recommend it for maybe the 900 to 1,000 group. And uh, I'm not, a, by the way, I'm not 100% sold on that book. I was mostly because other people were into it. Um, but it does talk about mating patterns. And at that level, that's something great for those people to do. Right, here we go. B6. I don't like it. Knight E4. Why can't he move the knight on G1? Boss, just put your knight on E2, man. So notice what he's doing with knight F6. He is developing your queen. Thank you very much. He's, he's, he, he's determined not to develop. Now, at this point, we should really think about the F5 break. He's really encouraging us to think about F5. And the, the, the simple point about F5 would be to just to say, boss, I want to uh, develop my rook. I, I want to get my rook involved. Weird. Okay, I, it's not weird. I actually know exactly what you're thinking. You're thinking, my only plan in this game is to attack the D5 pawn. Boss, forget about that pawn. You're not going to get it. And you're just wasting a lot of time trying to go after that pawn. He's going to hopefully... <laughs> Hopefully, for his sake, he's going to eventually figure out that he needs to play knight e2, c3, and then you can't get that pawn anymore. Mostly because his bishop is on the dark squares. So if anything, he has the advantage on the light squares, and that pawn is on the light square. Okay. I don't like it. Good. Yeah. Notice now, now you change plans, by the way. Right, because rook d8 was going after the pawn, and now bishop c8 is saying, ah, oh, forget that pawn. So it's important to see maybe in the notes that that was a, a factor. Okay. Now things are hot. And bishop f5 is confusing to me. What about bishop g4? It looks like that wins. Right? Bishop g4 looks critical. So bishop f5, and now dude goes loco. <laughs> Some people call this the fishing pole. Actually, we're talking about uh, how to beat your dad in chess. I believe this is one of the ideas, the fishing pole, that's brought up 
in how to beat your dad. And I don't think this particular fishing pole is going to work, but it's, it's at least an interesting idea. And one of the reasons I don't believe in the fishing pole here, the fishing pole is just the idea that if I take the night, the rook comes in, right? Uh, a reason to not believe it is because the um, queen on b3 is not involved in the attack. So can I take it? And the, the reason to believe it that I can is, hey, next we'll play pop and pop, and I'm out of the pocket. Thank you for the peace, Bows. Thank you very much. Okay, Bishop F.A. What I want you to see um, about yourself, Magian, here, is there were two points in this game where your opponent put, uh, created what seemed to be a threat, and then you responded with passivity. And interestingly, there were Bishop C8 earlier and now Bishop F8 now. And, yeah, and besides taking the knight, I don't understand what bishop f8 does for you. So you could say to yourself, oh, it was a mistake to play bishop f8 because I could have taken the knight. But also bishop f8, no one knows. No one knows what it's about. So you could, for example, play a5. That'd be reasonable. If you, if you decided you didn't, couldn't take the knight, you could play a5 and a4, for example. He's all in. And <laughs> now we're going. Now we got it, boss. Now, if he's going to get you, he obviously has to play HG to open up the rook. He says no, and now we should play G4. Does he do, does he do it? Ooh, yeah. So G4, and there's no mate. Forget about it. There's no mate. Yeah, because we're closed off the H file. The whole point was for white to open the H file. Now, now I'm a little worried, okay? I still think you're winning, but I'm a little worried. You run. You run. And I don't know about that. Queen F2, that seems right. Take it. Thank you very much. And now you, it seems like you're probably out of the, out of the jungle here. That's not gonna help. Check the miserable king. Balls. I shouldn't use that on stream. <laughs> but that's a balls move. C6, I think it's correct. That doesn't do anything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Game over. Okay. Good game. Okay. Okay. So. This guy's cool. What's his channel? I, don't, I, I hope that's me. I hope that's me, what we're talking about. I'll tell you guys what. I'll show you my channel. Go oh, this, this. You go exclam, and then you say training. That's, it. that's where you can find the Chess Dojo training program. We recently ran a promo. Pretty cool. Um, and speaking of promos. All right, my friends, we're back. I'm going to answer this question that we had at the beginning, uh, which was, I'll read it to you again. It's a sad question. From Danimal. <laughs> so if you're part of the training program, you ask these questions. We call them the sensei questions. Did either me, Kosti, or David answer? I'll read it again. I worry I'm losing my passion for chess. I started less than a half a year ago and was completely enthralled. Now I play an occasional game and really, really miss the thrill of training. How can I rekindle that flame? Okay. So let's write back. Let's see. Bob. Oh, shoot. I was sorry. This is the 84th question on Sensei Questions, so we've had enough. We've had enough. We've had a lot. Here we go. Uh, what should I say? I should say... Um, my experience with anything I've started is that the first couple months show the greatest gains and enjoyment. Some call this period beginner's luck. 
but then we reach some kind of plateau and we lack the cycle of positive reinforcement that fueled our early experience. Okay. So, uh, let's call it even fueled our early joy. Now the work begins. Ha <laughs> ha. Now the work begins and the dojo is a great place to do it. Personally, I've kept coming back to chess for decades now because of the beauty, the struggle, and the community. Okay, that's a reasonable answer. For a sad, desperate, <laughs> for a sad, desperate question, that's a pretty good answer. <laughs> okay, my friends. Uh, let's do, we got one more game lined up here. Let's see what we got. Oh, this guy above in the video. Oh, it wasn't me? Oh, come on, man. No, that's David Proust. He has, he has art, he's on our channel. And uh, he think he has his own channel. He has some raps going on, yeah. How are games chosen? Like I said before, uh, this particular game review, I'm just looking at games that were recently submitted. And also tomorrow I'll do a graduate stream, at least that's planned, where I review um, games that uh, recent graduates from one cohort to the other have submitted. Not all graduates have submitted games to the database. There's a lot of boomer GMs out there we haven't figured out either the scoreboard or how to submit the games. But that's how I do it. And I'm going to try to do this show that I'm doing here. I'm going to try to do it more often. Okay. So here we go. Let's do another game. This next game is from Dandier, also playing black. He was, high, was slightly intoxicated. Not a good place to be. Okay, so he calls this equal. Perhaps. Um, it's funny, actually. He calls it equal, and then I, it looks like his computer is telling him plus 0.8, <laughs> which is obviously a difference. Uh, so E takes D would be the um, more passive way to play it. CD is the more dynamic way. Right. Okay. Bop. Not thrilled with bishop f5. Um, why? Because the bishop, not clear exactly what it's doing. So the natural move here, I think it would be g6. Yeah, g6. And now he plays g6. Okay. The problem with g6, in my opinion, is it's too slow. It prepares developing the bishop without contesting the center with e5. Knight 8d7 would have been better. Preparing e5, bishop e7, and castles. Um, now, no, I don't. I don't think g6 could be could be bad. Um, it is weird that you put the bishop on f5. I would say if anything's weird, that's bishop f5 is weird. So, well, he's trading, which in general not a great thing for um, white because. Black is the one with a spatial disadvantage. Spicy, yep. Yeah. You should maybe say a little bit about why you say it's spicy. Okay. Okay. Um, 
now you play rook e8. Let's read what you write. I didn't realize at the time that black simply cannot afford this preparatory move. Maybe bishop g4 is a better try. Well, to my mind, first of all, the obvious move is take that bishop on d3, put your knight on c6, develop. Develop, Baus. <laughs> develop. It's time to develop. <laughs> so got to develop. And rook e8 is kind of weird. Play knight c6. And you're worried about uh, c5. Now, I don't think c5 is it, though. Because, look, when we take, he can't take back because this bishop's hanging. And if he ever trades, then our knight will have this square. Right? Uh, yeah, so so knight c6, not a double question mark. Now, by the way, what I like about it, Dan Deere, is that what we're seeing here is that you didn't consult the computer, which is great, because then it's like, right, we, you're saying knight c6 is a mistake because you were worried about c5. And then you get somebody above you, a plus, maybe me, maybe somebody else who says, wait, knight c6, first of all, very principled move, and c5 isn't actually a thing. A4, okay. And now you play bishop g4. So, um, let's talk. A4 is a very frisky move. And, um, uh, he's pushing his luck with A4. And this would be a moment to, when, when you say that bishop g4 is a double question mark, by the way, double question mark, that's kind of like, you know, all you just lost all your coconuts. <laughs> okay, you lost all, yeah, double question mark, that's when all your coconuts got popped. Like you hung something. Um, but anyways, if you say it's a mistake, we should say what we think is better. Okay, so for example... A4 seems like he's pushing his luck to me. And by the way, when you play a hypermodern opening, like the Alakai, hypermodern, I just mean you're handing white the center and stuff, right? Then the beauty of that kind of opening is you're looking to play actively against his center, whereas white's task is more to try to control you, right? With space. And so knight b4 seems really interesting. If he moves the bishop back, we can think about knight c2. And if he takes, then he's going to have to worry about both knight c4 and knight c2. It looks kind of like a hassle in the castle, right? Um, so knight b4 looks like, I don't know if I, was, if I was white, I'd be terrified of knight b4. Okay. Bishop g4, the main reason I would say that I don't like it is you're not developing. And yeah, now you, your knight is going to be a chump. Oh, no, that's AB, we got to say, incorrect. Because all he's done now is uh, activated. You're, he, kept, he, he got rid of your bad piece. Your knight on B6 was the bad piece. So the question was, if this, <clears throat> well, what is uh, black going to do? And if he plays knight C8... Then white can say to himself, I think correctly, be like, well, I, I got to be better here. Right? Bishop f1 maybe, for example. Got to be better because the knight on c8 is a chump. Like you said, I love that chump up here. <laughs> I don't know, different variation. The knight goes to c8, he's a chump. That's absolutely correct. Okay, so now we're going to get a tactical question. But I want to say I believe in your position here. Okay? I believe in your position. So, uh, the, qu the queen g4 seems like a, a reasonable looking move, of course. But the grief is that on bishop f1, can our bishop get out? Right? Now, the first thing we should say is if you just went back. I think you're doing fine. It's a little complicated. 
It's very complicated. <laughs> it's very complicated. I don't know. It's complicated, man. Uh, so the bishop g4 is a question. Bishop g2 is a question. Ah, you know what? I, I'll say I don't like this AB move, but maybe, maybe. It's because because the first. Well, let me just tell you the reason I don't like it is because Bishop f3, Gf, Knight c8, White's just better. Okay. Uh, whereas this one, he has to hope that you don't have anything. Hmm. For example, pop, pop, pop. Let's put him on f1. We can talk about h1 in a second. Let's say I just do that move like a chump. Bang. Or knight d4. One of those moves. And then ask ourselves, who's better and why? It's an interesting question. We got two pawns for our trouble. And the king is uh, going to be running. Bishops of opposite color give us interesting chances, too. I don't have an easy answer. I'm going to put it that way. So I, I'm just pointing out from White's point of view, I don't like AB. Queen G4 might actually be a double X question mark because you might be hanging the bishop. Let's look. Bishop F1, now definitely A6, I don't like. Because I think you're just losing your, your stuff. So, again... In the annotations, when you say that you did a move that you don't like is wrong, you should say what you should have done instead. So let's talk about this position. The challenge here for you is your queen is about to get popped with h3. How do we save our bishop? Or how do we get some kind of compensation for the loss of our bishop? Whew, not easy. There might, not, there might not be a way. <clears throat> I do have a thought. I don't know if this works, but my thought would be, could we play e5? The point is, if I if I land, if it takes and knight takes, then my bishop has an out. Plus, he can't take it right away because of knight takes f3. And by right away, I mean after h3, queen h5. There's no gf because of knight f3, right? And then if he goes d5, knight d4. Well, very spicy, obviously. Um, but now, if he takes, I'm going to be tempoing his knight. And it's, oh, we got some real spice, right? <laughs> this is the real deal. <laughs> now we're talking about the real deal. And not so easy. And, and say this move, which I'd definitely be afraid of, but then we can talk about that. Followed by knight f3. So maybe we could look at the variation h3. And now either queen f5 or queen h5. I'm not sure yet. Let's go queen h5. So the problem is my bishop on f3 still doesn't have a place to go. Let's say rook a7. However, it's not, he's not threatening to take that thing yet. So really spicy situation. Very spicy. Yeah, very interesting. This would be the kind of thing to spend some good time on in the analysis. Now a6, we're going to say Jesse doesn't like it from a variety of standpoints. You know, you're concerned about your pawn or something. At the very least, take the thing. <laughs> At the very least, take the thing. Um, he's talking about queen f5, but you're just lost after gf3, queen f3, because the bishop on f1 is such a good defender. Don't 
Toast. Yeah, toast. Okay. All right. So, my friends, I'll tell you what. We're going to do a deep, a brief breather. I get to play a couple blitz chests to just finish my week out. So we're going to come back in half a second with a touch of blitz. Just a touch, my friends. Not a lot. Not a lot. Thank you very much.